Okay, so welcome back. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is Patrick Allen. We will continue the lecture series on automorphy lifting with the third talk. Okay, thank you for the intro. Okay, so I want to sort of uh, sort of redrew this picture that James drew last time. And so what James talks about in the last lecture was sort of how you enlarge your Hecke algebra by including ramification. That'll be useful for the patching that he'll talk about in the final lecture. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this. This is today. Okay. Okay, so for starters, a uh, important ingredient into building this R infinity, we're going to first talk about local deformation stuff. So. All right, so actually, even before doing this, I mean, let me fix the notation that I started that I used last time. Um, just so F is a number field. S will be finite set of, I'll deviate a little bit last time, actually, I'm going to specify these be finite places this time, finite places, it's just more convenient for the notation later, finite places of F containing everything divided by P. Uh, and also, let me say, well, no, let me write it this way. And GFS, this is again, maximal, uh, or it's the Gawa group of maximal extension of F and ramified outside S and infinity. Okay, um, I'm also, you know, going to fix as before a uniformizer inside of some ring of integers of some finite extension. The residue field and row bar GS to GLN K uh, continuous. And I think I'm going to assume might as well. Let's see. Let's say now and forever. And it's not necessary for everything we do, but for some things it will be. But I'm going to assume my prime is bigger than N to make uh, certain things. Less delicate. Okay. Okay. So this is our setup. Now, for a prime in S, a local deformation problem will be. I'm going to say it's a representable subfunctor uh, D, say curly D, inside of the local lifting functor. So I defined this globally last time, but it's the same thing. So I have this sort of category of proartinian local O algebras, and I'm going to send this right to the set of lifts, rho sub A to GV, that's my decomposition group. to GLNA such that rho A mod M sub A is equal to rho bar. All right, so I want some subfunctor in that that's representable, but further such that it's stable under this strict conjugation, such that if rho sub A belongs to the subfunctor uh, and G is congruent to one modulo of the maximal ideal, then G rho A G inverse also belongs to the DVA. Okay, so that's what I'm going to call a local deformation problem. It's not a very transparent uh, sort of definition. It's a little bit ad hoc. There's a, a more transparent definition that you can find, for instance. Um, I mean, there's this older one due to Mazur that this is a little bit similar to. Uh, and, or in the papers of Clozell, Harris, Taylor, or in these very nice notes by Toby G on modular lifting, that is really more in terms of the lifts. And it's some sort of stability under a bunch of natural op operations, like taking inverse limits, taking fiber products, et cetera. But it happens to be equivalent to this, and this is much quicker. So given the short time constraint, I'm just going to do this. So 
right? This functor by things we talked about is representable. And so basically you're saying you're taking some quotient that the things factoring through that quotient are stable under this operation. Okay, so let me do some examples. I don't need it here. No, I don't. I, for, for many of the things I do today, I won't need it, but for some of the things I do. So I'm just going to assume it as a blanket, sort of a safety blanket for the entirety of my talk. Okay. Are there any other questions? It's very explicit. So what I'm saying is this is going to be a global thing. So remember last time, this R is some sort of deformation for ring for this row bar satisfying some conditions. RQ is just going to be, I'm going to allow some ramification at some other primes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to enlarge the set S to some S union Q. That's it. It's that simple. right? And I'm going to keep whatever conditions I had at S, but then allow it to be anything I want at Q. But the point is we're going to choose the primes in this set Q very carefully. And this is exactly what came up in James's talk also, that on the automorphic side, you had to choose these primes very carefully to, in order to be able to change the level at these complexes and have some sort of way of recovering the original one from the first. Okay. Okay, but before we get to the Q, I want to talk about what's happening, uh, yeah, inside of sort of our bad places. I want to give some examples of ways we might want to control our representations or our deformations. Okay, so for instance, one, Let's say B doesn't divide P, then there's, oh, sorry, let me move this up here. There's something called minimally ramified uh, deformations. So I won't define this in general, I'll just give you some examples. What we'll call this D min inside of DV box, uh, represented by. So by definition, it's representable. But the nice thing about this condition, whatever it is, is that it's smooth. It's represented by power series to x in n squared variables over top of O. Okay, and let me give you some examples that you can keep in your mind. So example of this. Uh, so this is an example of the example, I guess. Let's double it. So, okay, so if, say, if this representation happened to be unramified, uh, then rho, is, rho A is minimal. This minimal condition just means unramified. Minimal, if and only if, unramified. Nice. This is the sort of one basic example, but another relevant example that comes up if, let's say, you know, you were dealing with trying to do something like modular elliptic curves, particularly if you're someone like Wiles, who did his theorem in the form minimal and then bootstraps forward. Let's say your residual representation is conjugate to something at inertia, it looks like one star zero one with star non zero. Then Rho A is minimal if and only if it's also conjugate to upper triangular on inertia. Yeah, so it's another example of a sort of a minimal condition. So just putting these two things together, here's an example of something that's not minimal. Imagine you had something like a semi stable elliptic curve, right, with multiplicative reduction. So its characteristic zero representation would look like this with star non zero but such that when you reduced it modulo p, the inertia was trivial. It became unramified. You know, that's the sort of deformation that's not minimal. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? Okay, let's do another important example. And this is, example comes up exactly when you're trying to handle things uh, that are not sort of minimal in the literature. So now let's say, again, well, it's gonna be another V not dividing P case. So that'll be implied by the next by a condition I'll write in a second. So let's say this is just the identity. This is uh, this is trivial, and Q sub v, right? The residue degree at this place is congruent to one mod p. So let's choose characters chi one to chi n, g v to 
O cross uh, continuous, obviously. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I meant to write row A. Uh, minimal if and only if. Yeah, it is unramified row A. So that's what I meant to say here. Here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, here for this example? Yes. Yeah, sorry. This is no longer, no longer in the, so my example number one was minimal. I'm not doing minimal anymore. Yeah, sorry. This is, you know, this is my sub sub example. So now I'm like, you know, sort of going up a level. I don't know how to write that on the board. Yeah, yeah. So this number two is coming after that number one. Sorry, yeah. Okay, any other questions or clarification? All right, so say I have these characters. Then basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the deformation problem that is built out of saying I want the inertia to look like it has this shape that's a direct sum of these characters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, I'm going to denote this, sorry, and let me, ah, so maybe I'll put this back here actually. Let's set, just for notation, I'm going to let chi be the tuple. Chi one to chi n. So I'm going to set d v chi of a to be the set of all row a in d v box a such that the characteristic poly of row a of sigma. So this will just be on things in inertia. Right now, a second is a product i equals one to n x minus chi i sigma for all sigma and inertia. Okay, so I'm going to consider this deformation problem. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, well, otherwise it's empty, I guess. Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. And hi, I should be modulo pi. Thanks. Okay, so let's do this. Um, let me just point it aside like this only depends on the restriction of these chi's to inertia, but we chose them to be extending to all of V just because I want, you know, the abelianization inertia is much bigger than the inertia of the abelianization. So I want things that actually come extend. Okay, then, and this is, this is something shown by Taylor, is that uh, the resulting uh, uh, representing ring, RV, Chi, actually, let me say box chi is equidimensional dimension equal to n squared plus one. Notice it's the same dimension as our first situation. All points have characteristic zero. All generic points, sorry. All generic points. Characteristic equal to zero. Uh, moreover, if chi i restricted to inertia is not equal to chi j restricted to inertia for i not equal to j, uh, then this is irreducible. Let me just say, I mean, I don't know if I think it's we may not, given the time constraints, have time to get to uh, how these are very useful in the sort of doing level raising, level lowering, uh, going from minimal to non little level. But the important thing to notice is that if I take this, these rings modulo P, because these things are trivial modulo P, they get identified, right, as we change characters. And so what that does is it gives you some leverage of like, you know, identifying these things modulo p and that might give you information from one of the rings to the other of the rings and you can pass this information along so this is a useful trick and then the fact that this is irreducible uh gives you some leverage you can start from okay but i want to just say let's do an ex again example of the example okay so let's consider the case n equals two and chi one equals chi two is trivial okay then in this case right 
any lift factors through, right? Because this has to be now the represent the lift will have to have pro p image, but I'm working at v, not dividing p, so it's going to factor through tame inertia. Uh, yeah, any lift factors through, uh, let's see, gal FV came over FV, right? But this is just the, the group profinitely generated by sigma and tau, such that sigma tau, sigma inverse equals tau to the Q, right? Tau is some generator tame inertia and so it's angle bracket and sigma is some lift of Frobenius. So we see that in this case, this dv box one, it's just the functor that's going to send A to pairs of matrices, S and T. Now they have to be in one plus M2, MA, such that ST, S inverse equals S to the Q. Right, and this will extend continuously because I've heard this thing. Okay. And so I just want to point out that this sort of appeared in the guise of a talk previously. Right in Shin Wen's talk, he drew a picture where if you focused on one particular point and took the form of neighborhood, you're exactly getting this picture up to conjugation because I'm doing things framed. So, and in this case, yeah. Oh yeah, T. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Right. And and now I'm just since right everything this works in rank n, but now I'm going to use since I'm going to use my assumption that T equals two. This will actually have two irreducible components. Spec box one has two irreducible components. Uh, one, which is giving, so this will be sort of the unramified component. And this is a component that I'll sort of just, as in Shin Wen's talk, let me just call Steinberg. Right, and what this is is this is the point where this is where rho of t is generically non-zero. Okay, and they meet exactly in a point where this point is where um oh sorry non 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 yeah thank you yeah 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 sorry yeah generically not trivial generically non-trivial right that. Yeah, of course. Powers of, sorry, that tau is unipotent. Hmm. I think you just need this, right? This is the this is the relation on the Gawa group, and so long as you send these things into the maximal ideal, that'll extend to the Gawa group. So I think if you're in characteristic zero, then this equation forces things to be unipotent, but Oh, you're saying I didn't properly take care of the characteristic polynomial here when I wrote this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Okay, yeah. Sorry. And we also need that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. This isn't implied. So characteristic polynomial of T is just now X minus one squared. Thanks, care, Polly. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, okay. And so this is a situation where I want to, this is a little bit loose, but I'm going to say rho of sigma is sort of roughly equal to, you have to be a little bit careful on what you mean on Artinian quotients. But if you were in characteristic zero, this would really mean something like, this looks like uh, P alpha, zero, zero, alpha, and tau equals zero, this point where they intersect. Okay, so this is very similar to the picture that Shin Wen drew, right? And if you paid, what he was saying in this talk was exactly that for his stack, if you took the framed one, which I'm doing here, if you took the formal completion at some characteristic, at some point valued in K, that versal ring is exactly the deformation ring that I'm describing, right? So in some sense, his picture was more accurate and mine is really like a formal neighborhood. 
Okay. Yeah, it's not. No, and certainly this is a very cartoon picture. And yeah, I don't think of it. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I should say that, I mean, these things, too, because I have formal neighborhoods are, you know, it's these aren't really one dimensional pieces, even because I'm using the framed thing. This is, you know, sorry. Right. These things over O have N squared dimensions. So it's four dimensional. Sorry, yes, I keep thinking, sorry, I keep thinking sort of Lee algebra in my head, but thank you. Yes, absolutely. Rotau is just the identity. Thanks. Okay, any other comments or corrections? Okay, so, yeah, and so finally, let me also say a third example. It's very important is we need to take care of things at P. And let's say uh, now V divides P, and let's say V divides P, uh, P is unramified in F. I guess I don't, yeah. And row bar GV is, uh, is uh, Fontaine LeFay. This came up in talks earlier today. Uh, but one way to think of this is uh, with, and let's say with all. How much state weights equal to zero, one, n minus one. This is for every embedding of FV into QP bar. Okay. Uh, so, one way you could think of this is I'm saying that this is the reduction of some crystalline representation where uh, the crystalline representation has these Hodge state weights for every embedding. So, it's then. Right, there is a subfunctor, dv box, the Chris zero inside of dv box, uh, such that on on Artinian, on Artinian A, rho sub A inside dv box. Chris zero a if and only if sub a is Fontaine Lefay uh, with uh, the above Hodge state weights. Okay, so or another way you might want to think of this, at least if you don't want to think about the sort of Fontaine Lefay quotients in characteristic zero, the characteristic zero point. So if I take this the thing that represents it, and I invert P, the homomorphisms in the QP par will be exactly the lifts that are crystalline of these Hodge state weights. Okay. And so this is represented by some RV box, Chris zero. And in fact, this is formally smooth as well. So this is X1 to XD with uh, D. Well, let me prefer to write it as, sorry, let me raise this up where one plus D is equal to one plus N squared plus N times N minus two, N minus one over two times FV over QP. Okay. Ah, uh, this is this n times m minus one over two. This is sort of the unipotent radical inside GLN. Yeah. 
or you could also think of it as a dimension of the flag variety, which is actually probably a better way of doing this, right? G mod the Borel in this case. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Ah, uh, the weight, Hodge Tate weights. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, I'm thinking these are lifts that are crystalline with these Hodge Tate weights, which, if you think about, if you know, as uh, I mean, James was talking a little bit about the weights. What he thinks about is being automorphic things of weight zero are the things that are cohomological for trivial coefficients. And those are exactly the things that will have this, these sorts of Hodge-Tate weights. So that's why we use this normalization. Yeah, this is just like the basis, the fact that I'm not conjugating here. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the fontaine le -Fi thing, although, I mean, if you use, what I would say is that, yeah, it helps you with this fontaine le -Fi thing, which sort if you can use more general sort of rings due to Kisson at this point and where you don't necessarily have to assume that, but yeah, I'm just gonna use it here. However, for some of the, for what James was talking about yesterday with the change of Iwahori level, he also assumed P was bigger than N in that point, so. You know, there are a few places. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, but it's useful. I mean, I should say, I mean, it's a good thing to ask about some of these technical conditions because some of them are really the case that they're really just technical and they're not fundamental. It's just, you know, you got a problem at some point and it's easier to assume certain conditions. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the local stuff. So now I want to talk about is a bit of presentations. Okay. All right, so now let's assume uh, the endomorphisms of K GFS row bar are trivial. And for simplicity, this isn't necessary, but it saves me some time. Simplicity, I'm going to assume uh, the stronger thing that all my local endomorphisms are trivial too. Okay, GV row bar is trivial for V inside S. Okay, this isn't necessary, but the fix involves some things that I just rather not introduce. So it's a little bit simpler just to do this way. So it means we have universal deformation rings. Sorry, let me move this up. Rings are univ for row bar. And RV univ or bar restricted to GV VNS. Okay. All right. And now, as mentioned on my little picture, and I said a little bit before, what I'm, one of the things I'm going to want to do is add ramification. So I'm going to say, let's Q for now to be, uh, a to be determined finite set of finite places of F uh, disjoint with S. And then I'm also going to consider our what I'm going to call our Q universal. And this will be the universal deformation ring for row bar as a G 
F S union Q representation. So what I'm doing is I'm just saying I have the same row bar, but remember in the definition of lifts, I said it's going to be continuous homomorphisms from you know this group to GLN of A, but now I want to consider this larger group where I'm allowing ramification. So uh sorry, empty. Thank you. Yeah, empty disjoint. I said disjoint and then wrote the exact opposite thing. Okay. Let's see. Okay. All right. So now we want to understand now is the tangent space, right? So Hom K from maximum ideal M univ Q modulo M. Well, I mean, yeah, R Q univ squared R pi, the relative tangent space over O, right? This is canonically identified with this is on inside C of O, R univ Q to K epsilon, the dual numbers. So this is K, say, polynomial modulo square. All right, and that's exactly the deformations, right? D, let me guess, I call it DQ, K epsilon. Okay, so now, let's see, I already did that board. Yeah. Okay, so what's, pardon? Uh, omega, sorry, this is the, this is a, the var pi, this is my uniformizer at the start, right? Everything's presented over this O, and so this is the relative tangent space over O, okay? So then, well, I have a little bit of room here, so I might as well use it since I'm standing here. Okay, so if I, if you have one of these objects, right, row inside TQ, K epsilon, we can write it as rho equal to one plus epsilon kappa. So rho of sigma equal to one plus epsilon kappa of sigma times rho bar of sigma. And, and then it's an easy exercise, right? It's that rho bar is a hom. Right, the fact that this is a homomorphism is exactly equivalent to kappa being a cocycle. G S union Q with values in the adjoint representation, where add row bar is just the adjoint representation of row bar, i.e., n by n matrices with conjugation action in a very in very simple language. Okay. Okay. But, and another easy exercise row is strictly equivalent to row prime if and only if kappa and kappa prime is a co boundary. Okay, thus, this sort of nice formula that the relative tangent space is just given to you by Galois cohomology. T union Q acting on the adjoint representation. Okay, so in particular, right, this is a easy way to get estimates. Not easy, but I mean, you know, this gives you tools to give estimates on the relative tangent space. Because now if we go back to the picture at the start, I wanted everything we were doing to be embedded in some ambient space. So a natural thing to do is you just look at uh, sort of, you know, the tangent space for the object in question. And you take some, maybe some power series ring over those number of variables. That's a natural guess. 
where everything might live inside of. Okay, but it's actually a little bit more powerful. Instead of using this, I actually want to present my global deformation rings here, these R's and our Q's, over the local ones we were just studying. Okay, so for each V and S, this gives you a lot, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Choose local deformation problem. DV, sorry, had this being calligraphic, DV before. Okay, then. So we know there exists a quotient RV of the local deformation ring, RV universal, classifying deformations dv. Now, I just say as a comment, when I defined this, I defined it on the level of like the so-called framed or the lifting ring, because that flexibility is often very important, particularly the deformation problem I said that Taylor studied extensively that requires the assumption your residual thing is trivial, right? So you can't do that on the level of deformation rings. Um, however, if you do have a deformation ring, because the condition said that these things are stable under strict equivalence, it naturally descends to a condition on the level of deformations. And if you're representable before, you'll be representable here as well. So. So we have something here. Okay. Uh, but then, right, the map, rho goes to the collection, rho restricted to GV, V inside S, then gives us a map of functors, uh, gives us a map from what I'll call our loc universal. So this will be, I'm just going to take the completed tensor product over O of all these things, V inside S universal and this maps naturally then to our global universal thing okay this functor and so then we can set rq to be equal to our rq universal tensored over our local universal with our, our local, oh, sorry, I forgot to do this. Our local with our local will now be the completed tensor product of all of our local conditions we care about. Right, so this, any of these global, any global deformation, you can restrict it to a bunch of local ones. So you get this canonical map going this way. And so if I form this quotient, right, this, this quotient, this R local is just a quotient of this universal local thing classifying the local deformation satisfying my given properties dv and so when i form this right now i've just created some global deformation ring such that at each of the primes in s i satisfy my given conditions that's what this has done okay so this thing uh, is universal for deformations of rho bar that are first unramified outside S union Q, and secondly, are uh, belong to the local deformation problem DV for V inside S. And this is exactly the sort of thing that you know, you care about and things like the fontaine maser conjecture, right? You want Galois deformations that are unramified outside some finitely many places and satisfy some local conditions at P. But it's often technically important to have extra local conditions at other ramified primes for various reasons. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Okay.
So now I want an analog of the tangent space here, right? Where I take the local stuff into account. And so what I can do is do the relative tangent space. So, I mean, just by construction, right? My RQ admits a map from this R local, this thing that parameterizes all the things at V and S at the same time. So what I'm gonna do is let's let, so my notation I'll set H1, I'm gonna use a curly SQ. So it's gonna be a sort of Selmer group. Add row bar, this would be the kernel of H1, G, F, S union Q. Oh, sorry, coefficients and add row bar. I'm gonna use the restriction map to the product of V inside S, H1 local, G, V, add row bar. I got enough parentheses. Okay, so all the classes that are trivial from restriction to S. Similarly, I'm gonna find a dual Selmer condition. It's Q perp. And now this is gonna have coefficients in my add bar with a tape twist. Okay, so what am I doing here? I'm gonna eventually use some sort of tape duality, but this adjoint representation has a perfect pairing on it, given by taking the trace of two matrices multiplied together, take X, Y, and take the trace of X times Y. And so that gives you an isomorphism from add row bar to add row bar. So the tape dual of add row bar is just add row bar itself with a tape twist. Yes. So this will be the same sort of thing, but make my coefficients adjusted. But now my restriction map, the dual Selmer condition will be, I want to annihilate everything inside Q. So these will be sort of relevant groups that we'll study. Okay. And then some other notation, if I ever write H I, H I of blank, that's always going to mean the, the K dimension of H I of whatever. Okay, just some notation. So here's the proposition. Is that there exists a surjection. Um, from this local deformation ring and some number of variables to this global deformation ring RQ with Uh, and the bottom one? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let me just say what's happening here, right? Is you want to say dual Selmer conditions. So I, my ramified primes are S and Q. And so in the first one, my Selmer condition is at S. I want everything to be trivial. The dual condition is then allowing everything. And then at Q, I'm allowing everything. I'm putting no condition. The dual condition is forcing things to be trivial. Yeah. So what I've done is I've taken, you know, secretly, both of those are, you know, product over V union S, but I've taken certain subspaces. And then in the dual condition, I've taken, you know, the Tate dual under Tate duality, local Tate duality. And I'm just in this simple case where I have either zero or the full thing. Any other questions? Okay. And let me point out as an aside, something that will come up. Is is actually very important in the second one that I have this uh, product over things in Q that I haven't chosen yet, right? My S's are fixed once and for all, but my Q is I just said, let's choose a finite set and we'll determine it later. And so I have freedom to choose what Q is Do it later. Okay, so let me finish this. There is a subjection with G as equal to, and let me just make sure I get this right. This will be the dimension of this first summer group I wrote. H1 SQ add row bar. Okay, 
it's not so hard, right? If you take the logic that I had sort of erased here, but also I think still exists on one of these boards, right? So what do you want now? You want deformations such that because I'm taking uh, relative to our local, I'm exactly considering the deformation such that when I restrict to places in S, they're trivial. They're just given by whatever our local gives you, okay? So that's exactly gonna correspond to these co-cycles and then cohomology classes up to strict equivalence such that when you restrict them to the places in S, they're trivial. Okay. So this very top H1 SQ exactly is giving me the relative tangent space of the map from R loc to RQ. And then if you use what you know people often call the greenberg wiles formula, but it's just essentially unpacking the long exact sequence of Poitou Tate, this is the same thing as this dual summer condition at row bar one minus, I have an H zero of GF S union Q applied to add row bar of one. And then there's gonna be a, a plus one coming from the H zero of the regular add because I have this, I've assumed the endomorphisms are trivial, but so then we have that one dimension. It's gonna be a minus S. This is coming from the H zero at all the ramified places, the all the S plus the sum over V and Q, H zero of GV, add row bar twisted by one, and then minus the sum of all places dividing infinity of H zero GV, add row bar. This is the formula. Any questions there? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, is here? There's there, but it's going to cancel with other things. So, in fact, things work out nicely. Yeah. Ah, so basically, you should think imagine this R local is just O then by this tangent space thing I'd said before, it's just given by this first Galois cohomology group, right? Because the relative tangent space, that's a minimal number of generators of the maximum ideal modulo at square, modulo to the other thing. But now in the earlier construction, instead of putting that var pi, I'm putting the entire maximal ideal of our loc. So exactly what that means is that on the deformation side, when I restrict to all the places in V, I want to be given the trivial deformation because I'm going modulo the maximal ideal of the local deformation ring. And so then saying it's trivial is exactly saying when I restrict to V and S, it's a co-boundary. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, if you could calculate the Galois cohomology, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what you end up finding is, let's say you even put trivial coefficients here, like let's say you're one dimensional, right? So this adjoint then is trivial. You're just talking about Homs from this Galois group. And so now you're talking about the ZP rank of the maximal abelian pro P extension on ramified, which is exactly Leopold's conjecture. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Okay. All right. So that inequality may seem a little bit, uh, or this formula may seem a little bit strange, but it's actually going to be very important for us in a minute. So now let's specify what our Q is. Okay. So recall from last lecture. So V is a Okay, well, it's prime of, sorry, what's that? Oh, hold on a second. Uh... Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
I was looking at this and thinking, oh, I've really lost it. What's going on? I don't see it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so as a Taylor loss prime of level M, if remember that uh, QV is congruent to one mod P to the M, so this is from James's talk, and also the important condition is that rho bar prob V has uh, N distinct eigen distinct K rational eigenvalues. Okay. So now, so for a Taylor Wells, but note for such V. So what I'm going to do is I'm really, what we're going to do is this Q is going to be a set of Taylor Wells primes. So this sort of ramification. So this becomes important to look at, but QV is one mod P. So that means the state twist is trivial. And I've assumed that this has now N distinct K rational eigenvalues. So just by diagonalize it, you can visibly see that the things that commute is exactly an n-dimensional space. Okay, it's going to be the things on the diagonal. Okay, so for a Taylor Wells prime, this term h0 that appears in my formula above, add rho bar one, uh, this is n-dimensional. Okay. So now assume, I'm going to assume, now assume. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to put a bunch of assumptions. Let's say the RV are as in section one. Okay, so the particular examples I gave say you can be more general, but I want to assume that they're just assume they're the ones we talked about. Inside S. Uh, let's also assume, uh, I'm not going to have much room, so let me move up. Let's assume rho bar restricted to, if I take my field F and I join a primitive P through of unity, let's assume this is absolutely reducible. And I'm also going to assume that F does not contain primitive P through of unity. Um, and now last assumption, rho bar is totally odd. So what does this mean? This means that for any real place, V of F and uh, CV, the associated complex conjugation, conjugation, that the number of plus one eigenvalues of rho bar CV minus the number of minus one eigenvalues of rho bar CV uh, is not too big. It's either minus one, zero, or one. Okay, so basically, I mean, if N is even, I want to assume it has the same number of plus one eigenvalues and minus one eigenvalues. Uh, if it's odd, they're just a differ by at most one. Okay, so let me just say, I want to note this is vacuous if f is cm, or just totally imaginary even, uh, and OK, if f is totally real, this is a theorem of Cariani and Lehong. It was totally real. Real. And uh, rho bar is one of our rho bar m's as in James's talk. James's lecture two. Okay, So if you only care about the well, of course, we care about all cases, but all we can really do are totally real in CM. And this condition will be satisfied in those cases. Yeah. Yep. I haven't got there yet. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just sort of doing things piecemeal a little bit. So basically what, okay. So what have I done so far? is these assumptions are going to tell you 
that this number, this formula, is very nice up to this term. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do right now. Okay, up to this dual Selmer condition. Then what do we get? Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, hold on. What did I do? do, do, do. No, V and S. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah, probably I shouldn't have erased. This is the wrong thing to erase. Apologies. Yeah. Uh, abs basically, I mean, all I'm carrying, yeah. So the only thing it really does right now is get rid of this term. Ah, because, so, okay, first this decomposes as like the center and the add zero. And the, the center is non-trivial because zeta p is not an S. Okay. And the add zero is non-trivial because if you were reduce, so if you were reducible when you're strict to F zeta p, then you have a harm at F zeta p. And, you know, but this, that would contradict add zero, take twist being zero. So in fact, I mean, having this vanish is a weaker thing than assuming this is a bit stronger. Okay, and actually, actually, maybe since I'm running out of time, I'm going to go ahead and assume further. Let's also assume, actually, so let me get rid of my then. I have to speed up a bit. Then also, I'm going to assume, as Vitas was bugging me about, I'm going to assume some big image thing, that row bar restricted to F, the join zeta P has enormous image. I'm not going to explain this, because we're running out of time. Enormous image. But let me just say, it's what you need to make some things work. So it's a technical condition. So then, so the proposition, assumptions as above, is that if we let Q be bigger than equal to this H1, G, F, S, add row bar one. So, then there exists a set Q uh, equal to, maybe you want to call it QM of Taylor Wells primes. Oop, again. Level M uh, such that. Now here's, there are two crucial things. One is that the size of this set is equal to this constant Q. This does not depend on this M, okay? This is something very important to what we're doing. So it's some fixed cardinality. It's gonna be basically given by this Galois cohomology group. And there exists a surjection R load XG to RQ with G exactly equal to, so since, so all of the assumptions, so the main thing, what, I, what will you do in this, the assumptions are exactly set up so that these quantities, so this is going to be N times Q, this quantity is going to die. Um, and do, 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 do. yeah. And you're exactly concocting your Taylor Wells primes such that this vanishes, right? Why can you do that? Because remember, this is some sort of condition that says when you restrict to the places in Q, I want it to be trivial. So what you do is you try to use some Chebotar of density argument to inductively construct these primes to kill off class by class inside here until the set finally is big enough to force this thing to vanish. Okay? And once you have this thing vanishes, the magic is when you do all the numerology and you compute the dimension of this R loc using the particular rings I gave you and compute this minus this term with the oddness assumption, it's absolutely crucial here, you get this number, which is Q, sorry, not with G, I want the dimension of R loc plus G with the dimension of R loc plus G 
to be equal to, there will be, it's going to be Q N minus the L zero, where this is as in James's talk. Ah, uh, do I need the one here from the O? Okay. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Yes, I do. Yeah, because the S infinity will have one plus QN. Thanks. Okay, uh, as in James's talk. Okay. So notice this is the exact same numerology that came up in computing the cohomology of these locally symmetric spaces. Okay, the same number pops out. Let me just take one more minute to say finally, the structure of these Taylor Rawls primes are exactly set up Finally, uh, if I take RQ to be the universal GLN of RQ, RQ for V and Q, rho Q restricted to GV is conjugate to some rho v1 up to rho vn diagonal thing. And what this means is that the character chi vi restricted to inertia composed with the Artin map at v gives you a character or gives you a homomorphism from kv cross to rq cross. Because it has to be tamely ramified, right? This, prime, this thing is unramified modulo p, and so it has to factor the inertia character has to factor through this group. Inertia at V. Uh, this is GQV restricted to GV. Uh, no, it's really GV. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really GV. This uses the fact that this, these things are all distinct. The, module, the eigenvalues are all distinct modulo P and that QV is one. Uh, B is a good exercise to prove this. It's really on the nose. And so what this does is it gives you a map from this product, KV cross all to the N to RQ such that mod the augmentation ideal. What happens if we take it modulo the augmentation ideal it means I'm taking this universal thing, but then demanding it be unramified at Q. And so I recover my initial ring. So I've allowed this ramification, but the nice thing, and this is very similar to the story that James said yesterday, is that the ramification just is some sort of diagonal bunch of characters. And so just by modding out by that, we can recover the level. Okay. This is sort of the Galois statement of James's control theorem last time. The fact that you have sort of so-called no Steinberg or no e not. Okay. That if I take this, and I, sorry, if I take this module of the augmentation ideal of this ring, then I recover this R. Okay, so this is very closely, this is almost the ring that James wrote down last time, this O delta, up to just modding out by P powers. You have to compute it. I mean, it's sort of something that a priori shouldn't be true, but when you actually do the computation, it's it's the same. I mean, the, well, I mean, you might say the conceptual reason is that the automorphy lifting theorem should work, or that you know this cohomology should be spread out. Um, another, I mean, you know, I would say that say Venkatesh has other sort of conceptual reasons to why this not might should be true. Some map from local deformation space to global, maybe not being an LCI map in some way and it causing some spreading in cohomology. Yeah, but what I think maybe happened historically is that, you know, maybe Caligari and Garrity sort of just noticed in these computations that this L0 popped out here. And then they start th started thinking, wait a second, there has to be meaning to this. There has to be meaning to this and it has to be useful. And then the modularity lifting theorems in this context were developed after that. Before that, people just thought, oh no, it can't work. You know, the, the sort of R equals T technology of Taylor and Wiles just can't be, you know, just can't be made work, but it can. 
Okay. Yeah. Apologies. Uh, going over time. Yeah. Thanks.